Good morning, and thanks for inviting me. My name is Jan Dallin, and I have been programming computers for most of my life. I have created numerous video games, websites, internet services, and yes, I was at the birth of both Kazaa and Skype. Over those years, I have seen many elegant ideas that have been very powerful in their consequences. For instance, the simple idea of self-replicating programs that uh, created a massive problem, computer viruses, and an entire industry to solve that problem. Or take the idea of asymmetric functions that uh, form the basis of public key encryption, thus enabling uh, internet security and the whole e-commerce. But above all those amazing ideas towards the idea of technological singularity, the idea that I'm going to spend the next 17 minutes talking you about. Since the theme of current TEDx event is education, I will introduce my topic via problem in education, which is pretty much the same, pro same problem that the previous speakers focused on. Wikipedia defines education as the process of transmitting accumulated knowledge, skills and values from one generation to another. There is a problem though. Technological progress changes what subjects we consider valuable. For, ex for example, it's been a long while since we last taught hunting skills to our children. Similarly, in the age of computers, it is debatable whether it makes sense to teach paper and pencil arithmetic to our children or stuff their heads with historical facts that they could find online with just a couple of clicks. So the question is, should they think of the next generation as this? Or this? Or perhaps even this? Now, one way to answer that is to say that it is a false dilemma because technology is just an ever-changing set of tools. So education should really concentrate on basics and leave the rest to instruction manuals. But is it so? The problem with that answer is that computers are not ordinary tools. They are tools for our minds. There is something that truly makes computers similar to us in a way that, say, a hammer are not, is not. That is their ability to make decisions. On a very high level, this is how computers work. They get input from their environment, either through keyboard or various sensors. They run that data uh, through some algorithms, deciding what kind of output to produce, either in the forms of dots in the screen, or sound waves in the air, or even by manipulating the world directly via actuators. Now, if we drew an equivalent diagram for humans, what do you think it would look like? There we go. Input via senses, decisions from the brain, and output via muscles. If you think about it, if you would be replaced by a similar looking robot that given the same input would make the same decisions, no one would notice. In that sense, you really are the sequence of decisions you make over the course of your life. Now, once you stop thinking of computers as mere tools, but as one side of uh, human machine symbiosis, then an interesting question arises. What are the things that make us the masters and computers the servants in this partnership? Possible answers. Our brains are more powerful in terms of computing power. Second, our brains have better algorithms. Third, we have general, general intelligence. Fourth, we are products of evolution. And last but not the least, we were here first. So now let's take a look, closer look at each of those arguments. First, our brains are more powerful. Well, not for long. The computer that I wrote my first programs for 24 years ago was a Soviet-style mainframe called Nairi 4. It was produced in Armenia. 
Unfortunately, I have not been able to find a picture of it. Hence, I'm showing you a similar looking mainframe that was made about the same time in East Germany called Robotron. Since I want to illustrate the growing power of computers, I'm adding a picture of a rice grain here to establish the scale. Now this is the most powerful computer in existence today, Chinese Jianxie 1A. It was announced just a few weeks ago. To tell you the truth, I'm a bit bummed that the new king does not look half as good as the previous one. Great Jaguar made, certainly made for a much sexier presentation slide. And here's the scale for you. Jianxie trumps the power of my first computer by the same factor than the diameter of our planet trumps that of a rice grain. Planet against a rice grain. Let that sink in for a moment. If you drew a human brain to that scale, it would be bigger still, but not by much. Therefore, we really are on the brink of losing the first computing power advantage. In a decade or so, we will see computers as powerful as our brains, followed later by computers trumping the entire humankind. Second advantage, our brains have better algorithms. Indeed, we are still better than computers at things like voice recognition or image processing, not to mention poetry. However, let me tell you a story. It's about seagulls. Notice the red spot on its beak? That's how seagull chicks recognize their mother so they knew where to get food. Or so it was thought, until a Dutch ornithologist, Nico Dinbergen, earned himself a Nobel Prize in 1973 by finding out what's really going on. He presented seagull chicks with various decoys and measured the intensity of their reaction. Amazingly, the most intense reaction was elicited by waving a simple stick that was painted red at one end. What this means is that seagull chicks are not really looking for the mother. Instead, their brain is running a simple algorithm that tries to identify a red, elongated object in their immediate vicinity. Today's digital cameras have face recognition algorithms that run circles around <coughs> that one in, in seagull brains. What I'm getting at is with this is that not only do computers get more powerful over time, they get smarter. This process is illustrated by Ray Kurzweil, by a character who tries to write down all the things that he thinks uh, that only humans can do. Yet his floor is littered with ideas that are no longer true. Also, it's important to realize that once computers get better at something, they get massively, massively better. <coughs> For example, my little phone here can do more multiplications per second than the entire humanity put together, the entire humanity in this phone. Third advantage, we have this thing called general intelligence. At this point, I really must define what I mean by intelligence and generality of it. So here's my definition. Intelligence is an ability to predict the consequences of your actions, and through that, make your goals more likely to happen. <laughs> Whereas generality of intelligence is the size of the problem domain intelligence is applied to. To give you an example, this is Deep Blue, supercomputer that famously won a game against Garry Gasparov in 1996. It's chess intelligence. That is the ability to steer a chess game towards a victory was comparable that of to, to that of Kasparov's. However, his intelligence was also constrained by the fact that its entire world consisted of chessboard. Relying on such narrow intelligence, it was completely helpless against moves taken against it outside the world, such as unplugging its, unplugging its power cord that eventually happened. Now what if its world model included the opposing player and the world around the board? Not only would, be, would it be able to make much better moves by predicting the opponent, unplugging it would become suddenly a, a huge challenge. My point here is that generality of intelligence is not something magic that people, only people can have. 
This just means that we are powerful enough to apply our intelligence in a problem domain called the real world. Eventually, computers can do just that. Now, before we look at the two remaining points, allow me to define what I mean by technological singularity in the first place. Let's look again at the projected progress in computing power. Turns out that chart contains an error. It projects the curve beyond the capabilities of humans, and indeed, even beyond the humankind. This can't be right, because the speed of technological progress is largely determined by the ability of our brains. The moment computers pass that ability and start designing their own successors, there is no reason to keep our brains in the loop anymore. So that chart would turn vertical at that point, instead of continuing as it's projected here. Or as British mathematician I.J. Good noted that already in 1965, interestingly, that's the same year when uh, Gordon Moore uh, formulated his famous law, Moore's law. And I quote, since the design of machines is one of the intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines, there would then unquestionably be an intelligent explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. <coughs> Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make." End quote. Such intelligence explosion is precisely what I mean when I say the term technological singularity. Now let's take a step back and realize how, just how big of a change the intelligent explosion implies. There have been two fundamental events in the history of this planet that distinguish it from the billions of others out there. First, if you take a lifeless planet, introduce self-replicators and wait for a billion years or so, you get this. If you look around in a forest, the wonderful things you see there are products of evolution. Evolution, though, while often glorified, is actually a blind and slow process. It is limited by the fact that all changes it does in its designs are random, and subsequent generations must resemble each other. So it takes millions of years to produce something interesting. Millions of years. Luckily, after three billion years, all these accumulated random changes managed to produce humans. And this was the second fundamental event because it introduced deliberative design. So now our planet can produce cities. If you look around in a city, most of the things you see are products of deliberative design and not evolution. Deliberative design is much more powerful than an evolution because the changes are no longer random, they are planned in advance. Therefore, our products take mere decades to evolve, a million-fold speed up, a million-fold speed up. However, like I said, we are still limited by the fact that our brains themselves do not change. They were given to us by nature. A self-improving computers will not have that limitation. We would be facing a third fundamental shift on this planet, an event that possibly speeds up the progress by several orders of magnitude again. That's why it's called singularity. Now let's get back to the points of difference. Being the products of, of evolution is our fourth difference to, to computers. Although not an advantage at all, it is still so important that it cannot be overlooked. You see, evolution is where we got our values from. That is to say, our feelings about what in the world is worth preserving are a direct result of natural selection. Here's a great example from National Geographic, a photo of chimps mourning one of their elders. Look at it and realize that you're looking at evolved animal behavior behavior that computers have no reason whatsoever to exhibit. In other words, we care about things that life, family, environment, health, food, love, games, not because we are intelligent, but because we are animals. To illustrate it even further, I took the famous Maslow's hierarchy of needs and crossed out everything that computers do not care about. Not much left there, is, is there? What this all means is that if we just focus on making computers intelligent that we seem to be really hung up on right now, and yet to fail to transfer our values to them, fail to educate them, so to speak, then we would simply end up with ultimate psychopaths. Systems who would not think twice about killing us if it furthers their goals, he furthers their goals even a little bit. Which brings me to the final point. 
we were here first. Intelligent computers will be our creation, so it really is in our, in our power to make sure that they will be well behaved. And we should exercise that power. Or as Oxford philosopher Nick Postrom put it, basically we should assume that a super intelligence would be able to achieve whatever goals it has. Therefore, it is extremely important that the goals we endow it with and its entire motivation system is human friendly. Of course, the big question is how exactly are we supposed to transfer our values from the past three billion years to a completely blank system such as a computer? It is a hard problem indeed. So we must get many more people to working on this. For example, we do know already that the naive approach, like the famous three laws of robotics, would not work. Whenever we tell an intelligent computer to not do something, we will, it will treat those rules as, as an obstacle to work around. And, we'll, and it will do that using greater intelligence that we had when we put up those obstacles. In particular, the three laws of robotics can, can be trivially defeated because they do not prohibit the robot from creating other systems that are free from rules. More generally, instead of limiting behaviors by installing roadblocks, we should really focus on specifying the ultimate goals for the system, the goals that the system would stick to. However, specifying the goals is not easy either <coughs> because we cannot stop halfway there. Eliezer Yudkowsky, an American AI researcher, has said, there are three kinds of genies Genies whom you can safely say, I wish for you to do what I should wish for. Genies for which no wish is safe. And genies that aren't very powerful or intelligent in the first place. What this means is that if we find ourselves facing an ultra-intelligent computer that is waiting for a wish, we have already failed. It has to know everything about us before it becomes super-intelligent. Otherwise, we risk losing everything that it did not explicitly include in our first wish. Finally, to summarize, I would say that it is time to stop thinking of computers as mere tools but, and start thinking about them as machines that will potentially inherit the world from us. To survive that transition ourselves, we must use our first mover advantage to make sure that when the first three advantages in this list are gone, the computers will, will understand the fourth point well enough so we could feel safe leaving the destiny of the universe in their hands. Thank you. <laughs>